Hi guys, welcome to the Church Split. My name is Will, and we have Julius with us today. We do hey not have Brian. Uh, so guys, don't forget to like and subscribe to the Church Split, or don't and actually go again to one of the hater channels. They need all the help they can get because they're not nearly as fun as us. <laughs> I'm already throwing shade, but it's okay. Um, Blackmailing. <laughs> so uh, I have a the reason why we have this. Now some of you guys have already probably watched our episode recently about two gentlemen who got kicked out of their church um, for basically not being a King James onlyist anymore, not uh, being idol not worshiping a translation. Oh, yeah. So, but, uh, and honestly, this is one of them. Uh, we're going to have uh, Julius on, and we're going to have Micah on, and they're going to they're gonna talk about their experiences within the Independent Fundamental Baptist movement. And I want to make sure I'm clear on this, because I've been, I was accused of this today, that I, I'm out to destroy the Independent Fundamental Baptist. Mm. And to a degree, yes, I'm out to destroy legalistic, Amen. unbiblical... Amen. Yeah. On biblical teachings. That's mm -hmm. all there is to it. I want yeah. it destroyed. I want it gone. Um, I want the culty belligerents like the, the you disagree with me, so therefore I'm going to attack you and insult you and attack you and insult you. Or, mm -hmm. you know, because you were like t uh, recently, um, what was it? You posted a picture of your new Bible. Oh, yeah. My ESV. Next, you know, I was like the whole Facebook just Both exploded. Yeah. Everyone was hating on you. One yeah. person even said the fact, something to the effect of like, because you uh, got an ESV, next thing you know, you're going to be yeah. drinking beer with me and Brian. I'm like, yeah. I mean, I might as well not. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I came prepared. Mm. Uh-oh. Yeah. Are we going to tell him? Are we going to tell him? Mm. I don't know. I mean, the evidence is right here. <laughs> we'll leave it. To, we'll leave the mystery up to everybody else. Is the is the bottle empty or full, and who drank? Who made it empty? <laughs> the world would never know. Let the gossip fly, oh, and yeah. if you start gossiping about it, then you know that you're guilty. Yeah. But uh, anyway, the point that was a trap. <laughs> 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 but no, in all honesty, I, I want I wanted you to come on, and I had, what's funny is I had asked you to come on actually before. All this transpired, right? Yeah. Um, and the, the problem is with the the you know with a lot of things in the IFB is that there are these false equivalencies. There are people who say, like for example, if you use an English standard, next thing you know you're going to be drinking. Oh yeah, and things like that where it's like these are not one and the same thing. Are you going to get somebody who says because you're okay with contemporary Christian music, next thing you know you're going to be welcoming welcoming. Uh, LGBTQ theology, yep. like these mm -hmm. are not the same thing. These are all separate categories. Yeah, uh, and there's a wide spectrum in between there, people of what people believe. But I wanted people to get to know you personally, especially after that. And I had originally asked you to come on because yeah. I was seeing you spitting biblical fire. Right, I was just like, man, this guy's like. He really is saying some really great stuff. So I asked you to come on. Little did I know you'd move into my house. So. Uh, I know, yeah. I mean, I mean, but God had a plan. <laughs> oh, he did have a plan. I just think it was a. Uh, your it was like Julius's mastermind plan. He, now what's going to happen is going to take over the church split. Yeah. It's, it's just his secret way to do About it. About time. <laughs> soon, soon enough, Mike and Julius will be running this thing, and uh, I'll just be hanging out. Just kidding. But uh, <laughs> so in all honesty, I just want people to get to know you, and I want people to hear your story because I think there's some really important things uh, uh, yeah. in your story that people need to hear and some things that – some realities that the IFB need to confront. So, um, Julius, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you grew up, yeah. Uh, where you're from? Uh, were you raised in the IFB? Was your family IFB? Just tell us a little bit about you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was born uh, February 10th, um, 1999, and I was born and ra raised in Lansing, Michigan. Um, have I been in church my whole life? No. To tell you the truth, it's like um, I was in foster home for about a good three to four years. Very abusive uh, environment. It was like you know, this is not just you know taking out the belt and hitting people. This is like you know. It's, physical beatings and stuff like that. But after like three or four years after that, our, you know, me and my brother's real dad came, got, you know, me and my brother um, out of foster care. And then we moved in, you know, with him to another abusive, you know, you know situation. Now it was, it was a lot better staying in, in a foster home. But I just remember that it was like um, being at home with, you know, with my dad and my brother. And since, you know, you, if you look at me, I'm a big guy. I've pretty much been like this my whole in our know, entire life, and I'm not saying, trying to say that you no know, boastfully or proudly, but since but my brother well, was the facts more, are facts, yeah. right? You can say you're big. Yeah. I was always a yeah. tall, scrawny, awkward looking guy, yeah. so yeah, but I'm a little but jealous. my yeah, yeah, it was like my brother was more like muscular, but like very, very you know, fit and skinny. And I just remember like my dad saying, like, you know, was just choke, slam, you no, know, my brother and stuff like that, and me being a younger brother, you no, know, being bigger, so having to come to. You know, his rescued and 
and this ties into me wanting to go to church because, like, you know, I, I grew up in you know, the ghetto. No, I come from a broken home. Um, never really knew my mom because I couldn't see her till I turned 18. And when I did turn 18, got a phone call basically saying that she had you no know, lung cancer. And I'm not here to give you a sob story. I'm just saying, you no, know, this is my life. And just two years later, you no, know, after that call, you no, know, she died of lung cancer. But it was like, I'm going back to my track now. <clears throat> And I was uh, I was brought to church by a friend, and she was a girl, black girl. And I remember going to the vacation Bible school at the church named Park Memorial, uh, Park Memorial Baptist Church in Lancaster, Michigan. Uh, the pastor, the senior pastor, his name was Dr. Don Green. And I just remember going to the uh, vacation Bible school at the, at the age of nine and hearing the gospel priest basically saying, you uh, know, repent of your sins and your sins take you to hell. So I had a, you know, nine-year-old boy. I mean, that makes sense. You know, I just went, you know, you know prayed. But it wasn't really real because I didn't really understand the full concept of sin. I think I wanted to kind of address that for a second. Yeah, yeah. So an interesting point because you said it made sense to you, right? Yeah. Like my sins take me to hell. I think this comes uh, a little bit in a unique way from people from uh, yeah. not, from a, yeah. such a hard background, right? You lost your mom uh, at a young age. And you never really knew her. Yeah. Uh, you know, you experienced a lot of abuse and a lot of anger and hatred. But because yeah. you've seen sin in its yeah. darkest, deepest depths. Like, let's be real. Yeah. That's that's raw right yeah. there in front of you. I think because you experienced that, when you heard the message, you're like, yeah, that's why people deserve hell because yeah. I, I see what it is. So I just wanted to make sure, I, yeah. I want no, to address no, that good. a little yeah. bit because I, I, we hear all the time, well, how does hell yeah. make sense? Well, uh, well, if you've been through some stuff and you've seen how, you've, you've seen how dark people can be, yeah. you go, eh, okay, no, I actually yeah. see how this, how this why there's torment. So continue. Yeah. I didn't mean to yeah, interrupt. No, but I just no, wanted yeah. to address that. And so, yeah, I was like, no, no, nine years old, going to the vacation Bible school at that church and I just made a no, professor in the face just for the fact that I did not, didn't want to die and go to hell. It was never for the fact that Oh, I'm a sinner, and Jesus, no, Christ died on the cross for my sins. But it was a year later when I was um, in Junior Church, um, and a man named John Vessel was preaching. And what was weird was he was preaching against homosexuality. Now I am not no sodomite, and I don't hate homosexuals, but I do <laughs> and I am against their sin because the Bible preaches against it. I mean, if you're a Bible believer, you got to believe the Bible. But I mean, love them. But that's not the point right now. So I, I was after. Junior church, and no, I realized that it was my sins that you no know, put Christ on the cross, and it was my sins that was going to put me in hell if I reject you no know, God's you no know, wonder wonderful love of salvation and a gift of salvation. You no know, So after you no know, the junior church was you no know, was over with, you know, I was like, you no, know, I raised my hand. I was like, hey, I was like, I finally understand that you no, know, I'm a sinner, and I would like to you know have somebody show me from the Bible how I can be saved. So to make that not long story short. At a, um, at a very young age, at now 10 years old, I accepted Christ as my um, Savior. But I wasn't really faithful to church. I was like, you know, I would come here and there and stuff like that. But I was like, but I was still kind of quote unquote preach because I was still trying to witness to my friends and everything. And it was it was weird because like, you no, know, I was living, you know, best of both worlds. I was like, I was in church, and then I was church, and I was going to all these parties and stuff like that. And I never really drank. I know I never drank. I never smoked. But it was like I was just you know, I remember you know being like twelve, thirteen years old and stuff like that, going to all these different type of parties and stuff like that. And I, I'm looking at all this is like, man, this is vain. I was like, why? You no, know, I'm not saying that drinking is wrong, but I was like, no, just you no know, people just getting you no know, doped, doped up, drunk, fornicating, and then you know repeating the whole process all over again. And it was like, here's the thing. It was like, you no, know, my background is that. So I was like, you know what? I want something better than what I've been experiencing from the last, you know, nine, ten years of my, of my life. But what really brought me to church is for the fact that I was like, it was family. It was like, I would go to church, it was like, you know, and I would see, you know, the mom and dad, you know, with their kids and stuff like that. I was like, and I didn't have that girl. And I was like, you know, it was worth of, you know, quote, unquote, security. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I wish I had a dad who really loved me instead of coming home and getting out beat or you no know, slam and stuff like that and so that really drew me to the um the, uh to, into the church which it was an independent form of the church and i remember um kind of going ahead because all this other stuff is not really important but i got a letter in the mail from my youth pastor um and i was 
No, in ninth grade, and and letters simply just said it was like, hey, it was like we wish that you would come back to church, and so, no, we missed you. And the, no, the, the man that wrote that letter, his name was um, Mr. Chartier. And I, you know, when I got that letter, I was back in church. I don't know why, but that letter basically did it for me. <laughs> but here's here's the weird thing. So now I'm back in church, fully, you no, know, no, on fire for God, uh, working the Bible printing ministry, you know, glue binding books. Um, collating, uh, making you know, John and Romans in the New, you know, in the New Testament, in Romans and all these different you know, languages and stuff like that. And then something bad happens. Um, they wanted me to go to the, uh, to the Christian school there, right? But um, my, during my sophomore year, uh, sophomore year and, and during the summertime when I was going to my um, junior year of high school, um, I was helping my youth pastor, um, um, Mr. Chartier, um, build an addition onto his house. And I didn't have my phone on me because, like, um, we were, you know, around, like, heavy, you no know, equipment. There was, like, bulldozers. Oh, yeah, and don't want to break expensive stuff. Yeah, yeah I was, so I kept my phone in the vehicle. And I just remember uh, my, pa- you know, my youth pastor going inside real fast. His wife saying something to him, and he came out and was like, you need to call your dad and your brother because something bad happened. So, you know, I just go and grab my phone, you know, real fast, you know, so forth. And next thing you know, the child protection service, you know, got called on my dad because my next ne- next door neighbor saw my dad literally pick up my brother and slam him on the concrete go- ground, like, you know, profusely. And so basically that made a decision for me. It was like, do I go back home? Do I go to, like, a um, one of my fr- you know, family members' house or a cousin's house? And I remember for like the for for the good part of the summer of I think maybe like two thousand and fifteen, I stayed at my cousin's for like the, like two or three weeks before school started. And it was crazy, but um, by and then I ended up moving back into that you know toxic environment. I moved back home, and because they offered was like, hey, if you go back home, like, you know we'll pay for your Christmas, you no know, for your. No school bills to go to the Christian school. It was like you could just continue to work in the Bible printing ministry and stuff like that. And so I was like, that's what I did. I was like, now I worked in the, in the Bible printing ministry so I could pay for my school and I went to the school there. And going to school there was good and stuff like How that. How old were you at this time? I was about 16. 16 years old, earning your keep at the Christian school yeah. with the work yeah. ethic. That's impressive. Yeah. And now this is where things start to take a turn. So I was, you know, basically I was going to that you know, church since I was basically nine years old, was in and out, wasn't real faithful until basically my freshman year of high school. And this is where I'm starting to learn doctrine and you know, beliefs and you know, the con- and not even the King James Bible yet. That, you know, that kind of came later. But it was like the first thing that they, you know, they were talking to me in pri- and privately is when it came to you know, the issue of relationship and interracial marriage. I never even heard the term interracial marriage before until I went to the IFB church and these guys, you know, tried to talk to me you know, about these issues privately. And so I was okay, what is interracial marriage? Is that you no know, people marrying outside the race? Okay, what about it? It's wrong. Wait, what? <laughs> Mary outside <laughs> it was like marrying outside your race is wrong? Yeah. I was like, where in the Bible does it say that? I was like, I was like, I want you to show me, because I I come from a very diverse back you know, background. I mean, I went to school with you no know, whites, blacks, Asians, Indians, um, um, Greeks and stuff like that. So um, it was like, it was like, I was I was just I was just sincerely confused because like I never heard this before. So next thing you know, it was like they went back to like Genesis and talked about the, you know, the curse of Ham. I was like, okay, what is the curse of Ham? Oh, um, black people are cursed. I was like, wait, black people are cursed? And I was like, hold on. So I was like, not only can I not you know, marry outside my race, but I'm cursed also on top of that. Yeah, so you and, may as well not even try to succeed, right? Because yeah, if you're cursed, then yeah. there's no point because you're yeah. you're cursed. What's the point? And so I was like, so I was like okay, I, I deal with that other cursing part later. But I was like, tell me why. I cannot marry outside of my race. Um, outside of my race. Well, because you no, know, I had you no know, the you no know, um, my youth pastor, and I actually had you no know, the pastor wife. Her name was um, Terry Green, came, and, and said her reason was um, this is not today, but it was like back in like five or six years ago. She told me to my face that it'd just be better if I just marry somebody that looks like me. That was my own color. 
Now, to be fair, now before we get too much further into that, so yeah. we're now we, so you know, we see, you understand how you, you know, you got yeah. saved and you got pulled into the IFB because it mm. brought you, in a sense, some sort of security yeah. or stability. Now you're experiencing racism. Now, here's the thing I wanted to clarify in here because one of the things that people don't understand is that the IFB is actually f filled with racist beliefs. Yeah. Um, and here's the thing as well I want to make sure we're clear. I'm not woke, right? You're yeah. not woke. No. We both find woke stuff to be hilarious. In yeah. fact, you and I were listening to a rap song earlier that I was making fun yeah. of, and you and I <laughs> thought it was funny. Um, so you and I are not woke people. We are, we're not all about this, you know, oh, racism is everywhere. But there's legitimate racism. And that's and one of the things I get accused of all the time is that, well, will you just deny racism? I'm like, no, no. Mm -hmm. I, do, I know racism exists. I just don't think it's the, what everyone says it is anymore. Yeah. Like, it's lost its meaning because what you have experienced is true racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and for, when people tell me that interracial marriage is wrong, by the way, if you believe that, uh, you should totally watch. Uh, I have an episode on that. Yes. Um, and my wife is Korean, so get at me, bro. Uh, and so your experiences, so as a, you know, you're a black, you're a young black man, come from a broken home, and you know, it's like, oh yeah, follow God, but by the way, don't don't talk to any of our girls because yes. of your skin color. Yes. And there's a few things that comes to mind with this that flies in the face. It flies in the face of certain things, right? It, first off, it said that God created mankind in the, His own image. Yep. Which means all of mankind. Which it, the key word part, it, a key part of that is man. Kind. What did God do with all the creatures of the earth? He made them after their own kind. Mm -hmm. So we are mankind, and then there's dog kind. Uh, dog kind can intermingle with dogs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that you can have a, a palm ski now, literally a little Pomeranian, you're somehow breeding with a husky. I don't want to know how that works. I don't want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact is that they are the same kind, even though they look very different. Mm -hmm. We are the same kind uh, uh, black, white, yeah, yellow, we're basically whatever. Made in the image of God. Yeah, we are. And then, yeah. and the thing is, is when people focus on that, it flies in the face of that. Also, we know that Moses, being a Jew, married an Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. And when people spoke against his marriage because she was an Ethiopian, they're like, "Oh my goodness, she's yep. not an Israelite." Uh, God struck him with leprosy. And Ethiopians, for those of you who don't know, they're pretty dark. They're very, very mucho dark. Look like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 darker. <laughs> <laughs> so. The fact is here is that it is unbiblical. Yeah. So now you were talking about this um, earlier, and there was a text you received today because yeah. Saturday you got caught by uh, a pastor's wife, and she was saying that she was thankful that you never ended up dating one of their girls, yeah. uh, one of the girls there, because you were black, which mm -hmm. is just... I, I say this, and I have a smirk on my face because I have to laugh away how stupid it is. I know, Otherwise, I get angry. I hold my tongue. I was like, wow. I, I mean, I'm surprised you held your tongue. I wouldn't. I don't think I would have been as... I, nope, I don't think I could. But want uh, to read that text you yeah. received today? I think this would be this Yeah, would be so I woke telling. up today. It was like I was with Micah. We were you know, basically doing what we were you know, normally doing in the morning. It was like a filling out job applications. But today, um, I have a um, text from this pastor wife. Her name is Miss Terry. Um, the text says this, Good morning. In my regular Bible reading today, I came across a portion of Scripture that deals with mixed, yeah, mixed marriages. Would you read um, Ezra chapter 9, verse 2 for me? And then she says also, it is called a trespass, and the whole chapter 10 shows the repentance of the people for taking wives of the land. Do you want to uh, read Ezra chapter 9, oh, verse 2? I would absolutely love to. So it says, after these things have done, I'm going to read verse 1 because context is important. Uh, after these things have been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from, from the peoples of the lands with their abominations. I want you guys to notice that part, with their abominations. Mm -hmm. From the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness... The hand of the officials and chief men have, have been foremost, has been foremost. And of course, as soon as they heard this, they tore their garments and my cloak yeah. and I pulled my hair. And then there's this whole like repenting thing of like, oh my goodness, what have we done? Here's the important part. So if what you're, this pastor's wife, and I'm using that term lightly, honestly, it's just, it's, I, I have zero tolerance for this. You already know this. You guys yeah. know this enough about me. The clear indication here is it says, has not separated the people themselves from the peoples of the lands with what? Their abominations. He mentions the Canaanites. One of the abominations of the Canaanites is that the Canaanites mm -hmm. would 
burn children to Molech, babies, mm -hmm. and they play drums to over, uh, overpower the screams of the children while they're being burned alive. That's yeah. an abomination before God. Here's what they don't, what, the, what people who don't understand this to, again, because if this is true, if it was yeah. true that God was against interracial marriage, uh, atheists would love that. Yeah. And a lot of atheists try to use that argument, and my favorite part is to point this out. Uh, no, it was about culture and values. If you were marrying a woman of the Canaanites who sacrificed babies, you're not allowed to. Why? Because you were unequally yoked. Yeah. You were unequally yoked. You guys were of different cultures. You're not allowed to be together. Right. So what the thing is here is what they don't t tell you, what they're not including here, is in other parts like of the... Yeah, for sure thing is talks about this. Yeah. Well, and if you go into Deuteronomy, it says, allow, these, allow people to become what we call a proselyte. Yeah. They're allowed to convert into Israel. They're allowed to become Israelites. Yeah. That's what happened with, um, with the, the Ethiopian woman that uh, Moses married. Mm -hmm. She became a Jew in practice and faith. So this was always about culture and values. Mm -hmm. Why do you think God had those different lands destroyed? It wasn't because of their race. Yeah. It was because of the cultures that came with it, the values. So this is a complete misunderstanding. Right. And it's actually the fact that they're, that someone's looking for it tells me that they're racist. Yeah. And when you're racist, you are denying the Imago Dei, which is the right. Latin term for image of God. Right. You are denying the image of God in all of us. So when you are being a racist and you have this ter terrible theology, if we can even call it that, you are denying the Imago Dei. You're denying one of the key tenets to the faith. Amen. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's you can't say you're, you know, oh, I'm, uh, it's like, it is just as bad. And I'll say this and I, I'll probably get some heat for it, but that's okay. Go, go ahead. Um, I, it, it it is just as foolish to be that racist and believe in racist theology as it is to think that LGBTQ plus is consistent with the Christian faith. Yeah. If you believe that people who are affirming LGBTQ plus in the church is uh, is heretical and aren't truly Christians, I'm just going to say one of the biggest fundamentals of the faith that goes back over 6,000 years is the Imago Dei. Yeah. If you deny that, you're... You're, you're in heresy. You're in yeah. direct contrast yeah. to the scriptures. Yeah. So anyway, this just really irks me. Yeah. It really grinds my gears. I'm yeah. trying to like to not do my yeah. normal like rants that I do on here. So continue. It's continue. Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. So, but I yes. just want to make sure we clarified that biblically. Like no, that's fine. Ezra 9.2 is not talking about races. It's talking about cultures. It's their abominations. Yeah. Those yeah. people were allowed to convert into Israel. Mm -hmm. And if they convert into Israel, they were free game to marry. Yeah. Israel was a very diverse group of people, believe it or not. Yeah, and this is not even, no, this it gets worse from here. So the pastor wife you no know, tells me these things. Then now her husband's you no know, preaching behind the pulpit, you know, saying that you know black people are cursed and that interracial marriage is wrong. Now you gotta, you guys have to under, understand this that the church that I was going to, I was the only black person there. And there was, you know, there was no black girls or anything like that. So I'm 16 years no, years old. You know, I'm called to priest, you know, you know, getting ready here real soon to go off to Bible college. And, you no, know, here's all these good, you know, quote, unquote, godly, you no know, girls, just, but they're white. And next thing you know, if one of these white girls like me, I cannot pursue a relationship. I mean, what if God want, wanted me to be in a relationship with one of those, you know, white girls? Now I can't because, you know, I'm cursed. Um, God, no, God forbids, no, makes marriage, which is no, is a no biblical lie that you have to twist scripture to get your narrative. But then on top of that, now, now it's you know, being preached from the pulpit. And it's, it wasn't just at that church. So, I mean, I've been to you no know, other meetings and stuff like that, and other churches, you no, know, down south and in Indiana and up north, and here, you no, know, still hearing that, you know, black people are cursed. Now it goes to the fact that, you know, I'm saved, right? And I was going to that church for like, this is probably being around three years, almost, yeah, yeah, three years, Mark, I mean, going to that church faithfully. And now I asked the pastor, privately, was like, hey, I've been going here uh, three years now, and I would like to talk to you about me getting baptized. And the, um, the pastor was like, oh, okay, um, yeah, let's sit down about it. And next thing you know, it was like and during that conversation, it was not a very long conversation. It was basically me. Okay, yeah, can I get baptized? Oh, I can't baptize you. What do you mean, can't baptize me? When the time is right. It would, I was like, what do you mean when the time is right? I mean, I am saved. Like, the time is right right now. When the time is right, Julius, this is Jim Green. 
also his real name is James Green, said that like when the time is right, I will baptize you. So I waited, you know, you no know, years, and I had other people from that church. I had deacons. I had you no know, men of the church like, hey, just you know, you didn't baptize. I don't know. Go speak to Jim Green. Yeah, I'm gonna talk to Jim Green for you. They you know they go to talk to the pastor. Never come back to me. I no, I'm not issue. I had another guy who was like, Jules was like, I'm not normally able to come to church Wednesday night because of work, but if you get baptized, I will take off you no know, work on Wednesday so I can just come to see you get baptized. I want to go talk to the pastor. Next thing you know, he goes to talk to the pastor. Nada, never comes back to me. I've waited years to, you know, to get an answer and, not, and never got an answer. And I was just so happens to be, and I was telling Will about this earlier, that was, um, this is like two years after I asked you know, that pastor if he would baptize me. And every time that, that I, myself, or others would go to him, he said he just kept on saying, you know, when the time is right, and the time is right. And when I went to him the last time, he got a little bit upset. He was like, when the time is right, I will baptize you. Okay, so I just left it around. Now I'm going off to Bible college. You know, this is the end of my you know, senior year. Um, I went to Elgin. Um, Illinois, so I went to Providence, uh, and I was staying in one of the rooms that Keith Gomez uh, put me in. It was like my own private room, and I was just sitting there, you know, you know praying out loud. Just God was, you know what? I've been faithful to you. It was like, um, Lord, it was like, um, there's no, now hope. Hopefully, there's not any sin in my, in my heart. It was like, you know, I was like, you know, he was like, you know, my heart and you know, and matter. And the only thing that I was I want to do is, you know, become part of this church. It was like, no. I'm doing everything, but you know, for the church, but I'm not really part of the body. No, I mean, I, yes, spiritually being saved, but like, but being like a local quote unquote member, I was not, you know, able to, and I don't know why. And just you know, talking with God, you know, throughout all this time, it was like it was midnight, and I was like, you know what? I was like, it got to be because I'm black. It has to be because <laughs> I'm black. And this is a, no, and this and as soon as I admitted that to God, I got a phone call immediately at at midnight from one no from one of the deacons. And for this sake, I will not say this person's you know, person's name. But if Jim Green ever end up seeing this video, you know who I'm you know, referring to. And this guy said that I gave Pastor Jim Green five years to come to talk to you about about your baptism, and he never did. I came to you tonight. No, for the fact that I can no longer allow you to live in a lie. And I was like, you don't have to tell me. I figured it out. I was like, oh, you figured it out. So you know why you couldn't get baptized? I was like, who told you? I was like, nobody. I just figured it out. So he was like, okay, what's the answer? I told him, I was like, because I'm black. I was like, wow, you did figure it out. Yes, and that's, no, that's the real reason. Not, like, not like your garbage racist theology yeah. didn't give it away, yeah. right? You're cursed. So why yeah. would they baptize you into the family? Because yeah. the Baptists believe that you're baptized by water yeah. into the church family, which is yeah. actually not biblical, or nor yeah. what baptism slash mikvah ever was. But yeah. anyway, I just, of course, yeah, it's like suddenly click, like, wait a minute. I've seen racist crap this entire time. Yeah. I bet you it's because they're racist. Yeah. <laughs> so forget about Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 tells us you no know, to do. And so when I you no, know, when I figured out because I couldn't get baptized because I was black, he, um, this person, this man was like, Don't worry about Jose, don't worry about going to talk to Jim Green. I will go and talk to Jim Green for you. So he did. And he told you no know, Jim Green all these things. And this and this is sad that it's like Jim Green knew the truth that I knew why I could not get baptized, and to this very day has not come to me and talked to me up, you know, about these issues. And what's even more sad is that he said that I would have baptized you, but you know, but you said that I didn't want to get baptized here anymore due to the respect uh, you know, of Dr. Don Green. And I did tell him that I was like, no, I pray, and God told me I have the respect of Dr. Don Green not to get baptized there. But more importantly, the main reason, other than what God told me, it was like, you know what? If if I couldn't get baptized because I was no because I'm black, I don't want to be a part of this church anyways. If like no, if you're telling you no know, black people that they're cursed, that they cannot you no know, marry outside the race, you no know, their race, and then saying that you know the reason why we don't also don't allow black people to marry white girls because and join the church because we don't want their culture you no know, corrupting the church here. Yeah, because, well, black culture goes, if we can use that term black culture, yeah. which whatever, um, that, that goes against the yeah. IFB, right? Because they're, yeah. they're not about the inner city feel. Like, they're not about yeah. the upbeat and stuff. You know, it's shut, sit down, shut up, and let me yell at you for a while. Yeah. Um, 
So you experience a lot of racism. You experience yeah. actual racist theology, which mm -hmm. there's not many people to, that hold to racist yeah. theology. But the the ones that do, well, they're they're dumb. But uh, yeah. but you know, so you experience this. And, and I received stress too. It was like, oh, if you try to make any move on you know, any of our white girls here, and I was like, you can never come to back to my house. I had a church member said, you can never come back to my house. You know, you'd be you know kicked out of you know, the church. So with that being said, how, what did when you're hearing this, and you're trying to live life for God, and of course this is the only church you've ever known, right? This type, yeah. this group of people. How did that make you feel in the moment? Angry, disappointed, confused? I was more confused, and I was like, I, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of hurt because like, why say these things? Like, here, are, no, here we are supposed to be Christians, and next, you know. I was like, what the, the Christianity that you guys are showing me basically saying that, you know, I don't even belong here. Yeah, that, well, like Christ died on the cross for all yeah. the white people, not, yeah. not the black people. It's, you know, it's, I'll call it the white prosperity gospel, and I don't say Ooh. that. And I don't say that Spicy. to sound racist. No, that's what I'm, I'm experiencing. I mean, I will go to youth camps, I will go to Bible conferences and be the only black person there. And next thing you know, it was like, when they see me, you know, I have people, you know, do the stuck up look. And I had, you know, a preacher. I would go up to the preacher and take their hand and they would, they would yank their hand away from me and then get go get some hand tizer and, you know, and like clean their hands. Jeez. Well, they don't want to get, they don't want to get the curse of ham yeah. on them. And then it had a lot of people in pastor vibes and said, it was like, you know, when they saw me mumble underneath their breath, it was like, what is he doing here? See, and that, and that, so that right there. So, okay. Now I would like, to, I think it'd be good to make, cause I, I we, we're seeing, obviously there's that pattern of racism here, right? There's yeah. racism is prevalent. You've experienced it here. Um, you've experienced it in the IFB and it's disgusting, right? I mean, this is obvious. I mean, there's yeah. probably people who are listening to this right now right. and their stomach is just like going upside down. And it's just not this local church. You guys have to understand, was like, I might say, oh, it's you just experienced at that local church. No, this is every, to every church that I've been to and even Bible college that I've been to and also going to Bible college for a full year and still experience the exact and same thing. What is the common thread amongst all of them? They all happen to be independent mm -hmm. fundamental yeah. Baptists? independent fundamental Baptist hmm. churches. And here's the thing, independent fundamental Baptist churches, everyone thinks this is, this is what I've noticed what happens with people. Those who are raised in the IFB, uh, they they see a lot of the racism, right? Yeah. Even if they're, let, um, even <laughs> if, let's say, they're... Uh, they were raised in the IFB. They saw a lot of the racism. Yeah. What happens though then, so now suddenly the woke come and say, everything's racist. Everyone's actually racist. Yeah. Well, what happens is a lot of my friends jumped on that pony wagon because yeah. they're from the IFB and they're like, oh yeah, I saw racism my entire life. Thinking that's this giant issue. Yeah. When it's really, no, it's the IFB. And the IFB is actually way smaller than people think. There's oh, yeah. a reason why you could say a name and somebody will know that name in Oklahoma of just a pastor of a church. Because it's a very small interconnected group of people, but they're very loud, right? It's like those, it's like the loud screeching people at a riot. You know, you, everyone hears them. So mm -hmm. of course everyone knows about them. It doesn't mean that there's a lot of them, right? Yeah. I mean, not a lot of people go to Steven Anderson's church, but everyone knows who Steven Anderson mm -hmm. is, that sort of thing. Now, so moving forward from this, um, you, you left the IFB, Right, yes. obviously, you're on the church split. You, yeah. Most people from <laughs> most people in the IFB don't come on the church split. I have invited some, and not many people have taken me up on it. But I wonder why. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I just ask yeah. questions yeah. <laughs> and questions that you can't answer if you're in yeah. the IFB consistently. Yeah. Anyway, so you left the IFB, and what was the racism? The first, what, what was like the first thing? Was it the racism? Yeah. So you that was made you that's and the unbib question. And the unbiblical teachings about you no know, basically you know what God created mankind to be. That 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 was the first thing. The second thing that really woke me up to all this is when I started to go to Bible colleges and the next thing you know and I I, I experienced easy <laughs> believism. It was like this stuff was being taught at Bible colleges. And for the people that said, Oh, Jesus, you're just making that up. I mean you're, I mean, you're you know, when the pastor is telling you to leave out repentance no, when you just believe people, and you'll be saved. Yeah, and just you know, and tell people that don't answer anybody's questions. And then when your classmates was like, "Oh, I led ten people to the Lord that week," and actually, you know, another person led no, no, another like five or ten people to the Lord, and you, you keep on just doing that weekly. I mean, if people are getting saved on average 
no, let's say five people or ten people get saved. No, we just average on weekly, and you times that by a whole year. That's to make the news that your whole sticking city got converted to Christ. But no, <laughs> you don't. You don't see that. You don't see the no fr no fruit of that. So you know, you ten to fifteen, twenty people got saved. Next, you know, only one or two joined the church. Well, right. So what it is is that. Then the easy believism is a thing, yeah. right? I hear that all the time. Just how many times have you heard the sinner's prayer? Yeah. If well, all of y'all want to, if you do, if you're gonna die today, would you know you're going to heaven? Mm -hmm. All right. If you wouldn't know you're going to heaven, raise your hand. All right. If you raise your hand, repeat after me this little prayer, mm -hmm. and you know you pray. All right. Now you're saved. You know, Lord, I believe that you died on the cross, you died <laughs> for us, yeah. for our sins, and rose the third day. I mean, I've heard that same yeah. altar call a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's it's not repentance. It's not believing in the actual. Mm -hmm. It's just. A lot of people throw their faith in the prayer more yeah. than the actual idea of... Of the Savior. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's sad because it's false conversions. Yeah. And so you're being... So, so all right, racism was definitely a red right, right yeah. flag, which yeah. thankfully you, you recognize and you didn't get brainwashed in that. Yeah. And then you had... Um, you view of the gospel basically saying that you could get saved without repentance. Right, yep. And, and this was at... All the Bible, I, I, I don't you know what I'm on the church, but I don't really give a ref. I like the IB, um, Hiles Anderson preaches and stuff, they're they're the main ones, they both want their numbers. Um, Providence Baptist College, and I don't give a ref. Do you know, I've been getting te you no know, text messages and phone calls from preachers, so I was like, I'm just gonna be honest with you. It was like, you, you know, you guys do this stuff, you know, you're gonna get called out for it. I mean, it's biblical, you don't like that, you know, then you're an anti Bible believer, you know, go smoke that in your pipe and shove it up. So I don't Whoa. care. <laughs> that was the end of two, and also the college, the Bible college that I left, it was um, it was in um, Massillon, Ohio, and the pastor was preaching that, and I, and I got approved, and it was um, I have a friend, but I won't, I will leave his name out of this, but it was like uh, me and like three and four other guys, I uh, was told to basically move this lighthouse into the auditorium, and I quote the pastor said that the lighthouse. Light will stay on every week <clears throat> if somebody got saved. He said, if you come to the church and if that lighthouse light is off, that means nobody got saved during that week. So me going to Bible college, and this was like the second and thir or third week in August, from the second or thir third week from August all the way to like the end of like May, no, May that lighthouse has never got, no, gone off. And there was only like three people, maybe four, people was actually added to the church. Yeah, well, and that's, again, because it's easy yeah. to get false yeah. converts. So you had, um, I don't want to take uh, yeah. too much time with that. And uh, by the way, again, I'd, I'd encourage mm. somebody to go watch our episode on uh, on swearing as a social construct uh, created by man. Yeah. Um, so, but the thing is, is what I'd like you to do is you wrote, what, 13 points yeah. of why you left fundamentalism. And I had some hope. It was like, um, man, I I I believe in giving credit when credit is due, but for, I'm not going to drop his this his person name. But I had a really good friend that helped helped me on on these points, but I just added on to the points that me and him you no know, basically put together. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So yeah. what? So I think this would be important because I thought the 13 points were fire. Like I yeah. I read that and I was like, man, I can shoot. I need to make that in a <laughs> document and sell it. That was amazing. Yeah. So you you left the IFB, thank the Lord, and now you're pursuing you know what we call biblicism yeah. and orthodoxy. And I think a lot of people are, and I just want to make sure I clarify this here. You know, I think people are going to, you're rightfully angry, mm -hmm. I think. Now you're you actually control yourself way better than I would expect a lot of people who've been through what you've been through. But man, maybe that's because you've been through so much that it doesn't get you to you that strongly. Mm. But one of the things that people are going to mistake your fervor and your anger toward it as as hatred and bitterness. Yep. But it's not what it what you know. As I've talked to you and I've gotten to know you pretty well the last few days, we haven't really stopped talking when I've been home. We kind of don't shut up. <laughs> we just we're really getting yes. to know each other, and I love that. Um, but what we're having here is we're told to be uh, to be angry, but sin not. But we're also told to call out false teaching. First Peter, uh, First Timothy points us out in I think five ten. Yeah, uh, that says you know to call out false teaching. That you know racist teaching is terrible. Then also you know Ephesians five eleven says to ex 
expose the works of darkness. Mm -hmm. And when you have beat people down, when you say these terrible things, and you have gotten nasty phone calls, and I had, yeah. I had one of the people who were angry at you try to get angry with me um, re even today and was trying to demand a phone call. I'm like, look, man, I, I, get, I have zero obligation to give mm -hmm. anyone the time of day because everyone, everyone who disagrees with me wants to, ha wants to have a yeah. fight. I'm like, and until you can stop going, you're this, and you're that, and you're this, and you're that. Until you can stop doing all the, the, a, ter a character and attacks. And have a conversation. And have a conversation. Yeah. That's not worth it. Um, and so you've been getting attacked all day. You and Micah both have yeah. getting, like, repeated phone calls and stuff. Yeah. Um, it's kind of nasty. I mean, yeah. people are just outright there. You know, they can't accept the fact that you left. You, yeah. said, you said your piece. Um, and it's mm -hmm. funny because they're all saying that you're trying to start stuff. Yeah. If you follow your Facebook, I'm like, he actually said, like, yeah. He, 13 reasons why he's leaving and he posted yeah. that he bought a new bible yeah and people got mad about that so yeah. this goes to show you can't please people you can't please people so yeah. uh with that being said why don't you uh well, let's start going through these 13 points i think it'd be yeah. fun all right point number one so point number one on why i left the independent film baptist movement says this elevation of ifb culture traditions and prefaces to a level equal with biblical doctrine and commands, and that's from Matthew um, chapter 15, verse 9. Tradition, culture, and pastoral opinion are frequently taught as God-given commands, and I got, no, you go through Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, it was talks about that, and it's talked about from pulpits. Uh, these non-biblical standards are then used to attack and criticize others with different views and are commonly forced on other believers. The independent form of Baptist churches frequently forsake the historic Baptist distinctives of individual soul liberty. Outward you know, compliance with the church's culture and or pastor's preferences is often mandated. Church members are not allowed to publicly sow uh, differing beliefs or preferences. Yeah, preferences. Pressure and intimidation are used to um, coerce um, co um, compliance. A Christian's uh, liberty is Christ is uh, yeah Christ is thus violated by the preferences of those around him. Uh, point number two says this: elevation of secondary and tertiary issues like clothing, music, etc., to a place of primary importance to the point of attacking and separating from other Christians based on these um, disagreements. And which we will, later we'll dive more into, deep into that if you want to. Uh, where did I leave off? I mean, if it, uh, everyone can look, watch the previous episode before this yeah. and see how you guys were removed from that. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out is this is not unique to the IFB. No. You're, you're talking about the IFB here because, and I, again, because I'm the RFP, net, I'm par part of the RFP network. I'm always connected to IFB people. Yeah. I was raised in it. So I feel like sometimes it's like, yeah, do I sometimes feel like the, the IFB is under my little magnifying glass? Yes, but it's because yeah. I'm in constant contact. But what you're reading here, what you're stating here, is experienced in a lot of groups of churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses are kind of the same way, right? These aren't half the stuff that they believe mm -hmm. isn't biblical, but yeah. it's pushed up to man. Well, Pentecostal, certain Pentecostal mm -hmm. groups are the same way. You know, whatever the pastor says is the ultimate authority. My secondary preferences or whatever are yeah. equal and worth separating over. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to make sure that we're clear. This is yeah. not a unique thing to the no, IFB. These are the this is a problem I, in Christianity. Yeah. Yeah, these are the go. things that I you know seen and personally experienced. But let's uh, continue reading. It says also an unbiblical view and standard of the separation are commonly taught other Christians who hold to the, to the same fundamentals of the faith as independent fundamental Baptist churches are never you no know, fellowship with and are avoided. Routine bashing, attacking, and ridiculing of other denominations. And groups of Christians, you know, from pulpits, which is funny, but because like when you start to talk about, you know, the sins of that, you know, if you're from that group, they don't like it. But it's okay when we rant and bash others who are not, you know, IFP. Point number three: unbiblical church. You know, um, <laughs> it's hard for me to pronounce this word, but eschatology and leadership orga organization. Scripture um, teaches a uh, plurality. You know, plurality of elders, yet almost all IFB churches have a single, all-powerful man who rules the church in a top-down system with little to no accountability to his congregation. The biblical model includes deacons and the church structure, yet they are often missing entirely or merely used as a rubber stamp committee for the senior pastor's decrees. Most IFB church leaders, uh, yeah, leader structures are more Catholic, no, uh, Episcopal, uh, 
Episcopal. If you, yeah. Installed in the historic Baptist, you no, know, meaning congregational, elevation and glorification of pastors and those in full time ministry to an unhealthy and unbiblical level. That uh, the doctrine of the priesthood of believers is frequently trampled on in this environment. They people are told they must have their pastor's approval or advice before making big decisions, ignoring the fact that the spirit can lead each Christian individually. Now, what I want to do is I'm also going to post this, I think, uh, on the video okay, uh, yeah. comments below and pin it just so people can read it for themselves. But um, let's let's go back and forth here. I'll, yeah. I'll read the next one, then you read the next one. This will just be yeah. helpful um, just because it'll make it sound more interactive. It'll be yeah. fun. All right, so number four, uh, you said, oh, shoot, uh, Micah was gonna, mm. Micah's gonna go crazy on this one. Cover ups and sexual abuse in the IFB churches, organizations across the country, rampant scandal for decades with a strong culture of secrets and silence, a denomination known for the sexual sins of its leaders. The church is to be a bastion of light and truth, yet the IFB movement has a sordid history of cover ups, hiding of evidence, and outright ignoring the sins of its members. Few, if any, call for repentance, whereas defending abusers and predators is historically common. Little to no accountability for pastors who disqualify themselves from the ministry. Shame and blame placed on victims instead of the perpetrators. Yep. Go ahead and yeah. read number All five. Right. Number five, lack of strong doctrinal teaching from the pulpits, frequent preaching. <laughs> Unless it's the King yeah. James only, yeah. of course. Yeah. Then that's the number one emphasized yeah. issue. Yeah, that's a, no, that's a <laughs> holy doctrine. Yeah, it's, it's the most important one. Yep. Frequent preaching of the Bible out of context and twisting of Scripture to make a good message. No, consequently, the average member of a IFB church has a shallow and anemic understanding of good doctrine, the fundamentals of the faith, and at times even the gospel itself. Exactly. And then number six, you said, frequent mixing of politics and Christianity. Many IFB are more American than Christian. America and some politicians, like Trump, are sometimes elevated to nearly idolatrous positions. This is bringing the world into the church and on, on a grand scale. And I think that's a really important yes. point, too, because you can be... I am a very politically engaged person. Yeah. I am a libertarian conservative is my, is my political leaning. And I do believe it is as much as I've looked into things, I'm like, I believe it's the most consistent way I can live a Christian life yeah. in a society that's not. I'm a very politically engaged person, but there's a difference between being politically engaged and like bringing it into your church as a thing that's preached regularly. Um, yeah. The church should be preaching um, about doctrines and about life change and <laughs> Uh, yeah. morality not necessarily politics and especially the trump worship so anyway or even america to, itself because no i guess no israel is not known a holy nation but america is oh yeah where the, yeah where, where america yeah. comes yeah exactly yeah. so all right number seven yep church culture of performance based christianity man this one grabs my gears the more you do the better you are acceptance and, ve and value are gained by the amount of work one performs for God and by keeping checklists of do's and don'ts. Sanctification is taught as being a result of our hard work rather than the work of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is taught as being only needed for salvation rather than being needed for our daily walk with God. You know what's funny is that they'll oftentimes deny this, but their actions speak louder than the yeah. words. They're like, no, we don't we don't say that. But then yeah. they will turn around and they push this. Like, yeah. you know, oh, well, if you don't do this, you're not really saved. Or if you don't do this, we question yeah. your salvation. You go to movie, you buy yeah. a new Bible and we'll come yeah. after you. Yeah. Um, but remember, we're not teaching works-based salvation yeah. at all. Yeah, not at all entirely. You know, if you if you don't believe, if you know if you're not KJV only, you know you're pretty much going to hell. Yep. Don't know who Christ is. Number eight, you wrote uh, church cultures that are harshly critical and judgmental of others. Pharisaical attitudes ab abound. This leads to church cultures that discourage vulnerability and transparency among the brethren. Rather, an atmosphere of everything is great prevails. Yeah. Common measuring of others' spirituality based on external factors like wearing a suit or a dress, no tattoos, etc., leading to pride, arrogance, and dismissive attitudes towards those with a quote-unquote lower standards. Yeah. And my personal um, issues with this is that I'm not against people wearing suits. And I had this talk with my pastor and the, men, and the men of my former church multiple times. There is nothing wearing a suit to church that is wrong. But if you say that only wearing a suit is right, 
And then it was like, ah, oh, man, okay, I'm going to go to these other since I take on the suit. I just told him, was like, if you, yes, go to the church, wear a suit, fine. But then to say from the pulpit that if you don't wear a suit, it's wrong and you're sinful and not doing so is basically twisting the Bible and it's, you know, hypocritical and it's, you know, wrong. It's not mm-hmm. doctrinal. Now, um, well, yeah. what's funny is like yeah. the number nine we already covered, yeah. your easy believism, right? Yeah. So, and then number 10 goes along with it, which is just, uh, which was covered within that as well, the emotional mm-hmm. manipulation and dishonest uh, invitations, like, yeah. right? Like the idea of high pressure altar calls. Yeah. Like, Oh, well, we only keep coming. Come on down. Come on. Yeah. It's that pressure and trying to get false converts. So it's funny because nine and 10 go together and we already covered yeah. those. So I love it when our, when fate works together. And here's the thing. A lot of people, you know, a lot of preachers in the IP will say that if you don't get you know, saved at the altar, that's your, you no, know, that's your salvation is not real. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I, I mean, I've seen that too, or yeah. like, oh, it's not really genuine if you really didn't come forward because yeah. if you, because they take it as, uh, and I've literally heard them say this, you going down to the altar to get saved is uh, affirming him before men, apparently. So, like, yeah. well, remember, if you can, uh, don't affirm me before men, you deny me before men, yeah. I'll deny you. And they'll use that out of context to say that you need to go to the altar to get saved because yeah. you shouldn't be ashamed of, of going forward. Yeah. And it's such a dishonest, and there's so many textual and contextual problems with that <laughs> with yeah, that interpretation yeah. um and it's also really funny because it's, it's very reflective of like those pentecostal high-end charismatic churches where yeah. it's like come on down but and be blessed come on yeah. down and be blessed but meanwhile they preach against them yeah. saying they're worldly i just find yeah. it ironic yep they're not um, charismatic but yep have so, charismatic practices yeah so um, number 11 yeah. is is number is that your turn yeah, yeah it's my turn okay um number 11 says this a culture and teaching that promotes the um, dig, dig, man. <laughs> Denigration? Your, yeah. My vocabulary is so yeah. good, but I have a hard time yeah. reading it. <laughs> and there, no, and yeah, different respect to women. Women value is taught as being connected to the quality of, uh, of a man that marries, mm. marries. And then it says, um, pastor wife, min- missionary's wife, etc., rather than it being an image bearer of God. It says, um, Bible teaching and theology geared specifically Towards women is miserably anemic and consists almost entirely of housekeeping and, uh, and husband pleasing. Uh, women are held to unequal and often unbiblical standards when it comes to modesty and are commonly blamed for the sexual sins of men. Yeah, and that's so true. Uh, yeah. How many times have I heard of women actually? Yeah. And this is this is prevalent in the IFB. Yeah. Women get accused of making men sin all the time. Yeah. And it's funny because I don't remember Jesus saying, if a man looks upon a woman with lust, then she better cover up. Yeah. That's not how, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery, what? In your own heart already. uh, Chapter six, verse five, I believe. Yeah. And so it's, it's, uh, it's nonsensical. And it's this all, again, like it says, the pastor's wife. And it's very, it's very like, it's very denigrating to women in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Number 12, you wrote this, that the wrong view of the gospel and believer's baptism and the failure of not being applied to all nations, but is limited to a particular race that the majority of the IFB churches, but not all of them, would only witness to and baptize. This contradicts Matthew 28. And this is so it's so true because, again, if you're there, and this isn't true for all the IFB, I, yeah. I will say this to be, to be gracious, not that all the IFB is entirely racist. But there is a large prevalent, uh, and especially I know the camp of which that you came from. I know that group of IFB, and that yep. does tend to go with that particular group. Yeah. I told you before I went to, uh, I was on more high end IFB, like Calvary Baptist yeah. or uh, um, Crown College, Bob Jones. So that that sort of racist uh, theology wasn't prevalent. Yeah. In fact, it was, which is why I think in our church we saw more uh, diversity because yeah. it's amazing, man. When you tell black people that they're cursed, they don't yeah. want to go to your church. No. <laughs> Weird, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, who wants... It, it, what's funny is that how all these people are, are very conservative, right? They're conservative yeah. even politically. Yeah. And they probably... And I can, I'll, I'm going to make a, I'm gonna make a prophetic guess, okay? okay? If I had a crystal ball in front of me, I'd be able to tell you that every single one of them hate being, being told that they have white privilege. I bet you every single one of them hate being told that they have... Uh, any specialty because they're white, that yeah. white people have more power, and that white people are racist, and I bet you they, they all hate being called that. Meanwhile, yeah. they think it's okay to say that you're cursed because of your skin color. Yeah. Make that make sense. Either it's either skin color yeah. matters or it doesn't, okay? <laughs> yeah. So I will let you take this uh, 
um, take this last one yeah. and go ahead and hit number 13. Yeah, this, this is, is my, the one that's yeah. been killing you today yeah. and yesterday. This and all is my week, favorite, really. It's my favorite point. Um, point number three is uh, the reason why I personally left you know, the independent formal Baptist movement. It's the use and misuse of the King James Bible by trying to make it the golden standard and superior to all other translations before and after its making. The false view is saying that the King James is the only perfect word of God that the English people and the rest of the entire world should only use. This is crazy. The translators of the, of the, of the KJV would beg a differ because they, the translators, said themselves it was it was not perfect and would need to be improved upon later. And this entire view, this is it. This is what kills me. This entire view violates Second Timothy, yeah, Second Timothy three sixteen, and also um, viol, um, violates. Um, yeah, I had the scripture in my head. I can't remember, but it's just, it violates uh, Second uh, Second Timothy three sixteen because what does uh, Second Timothy three sixteen tells us? Now, all scripture, all scripture is you know is given by the inspiration of God and is for reproof, doctrine, and you know, correction. So here's the thing. Well, no, didn't we not have the Word of God before sixteen eleven? You know, did not did not you know the sixteen eleven Bible get you know get their you know translated translations or their word from different manuscripts? And so, if these other manuscripts were not perfect, that in, you know to begin with, and the translators of the King James meant to those other you no know, non biblical uninspired, not perfect, you no know, manuscripts to copy the 1611. That means that, you know, the King James Bible, 1611, this, it was not perfect even to begin with if you believe that the King James Bible is is only correct. Well, funny, because the uh, the letter to the reader is that the King James yeah. writer, the translators even said that, that it's not a perfect translation yeah. and that it should always be written in the common tongue and updated because mm -hmm. they uh, they even knew the difference there. So that's very true. And so these are 13 powerful points. I'm going to copy and paste them and pin them in the YouTube comment below because I think yeah. they're just they're so well worded. And I was actually genuinely, I was reading like, dang, that's so well said. And uh, honestly, this, kind, this goes into why I think the IFB is going to slowly die. There are yeah. some people that are going to stay. You know, there's uh, the friend of yours, that I'm, I'm legitimately, I feel bad for him because, I mean, he was the one that was calling, yelling at you and going crazy yeah. on your Facebook, tried to yell, yell, yell and call, call me. And I just, the thing is, is that there comes a point in time where mark those who teach a contrary gospel and avoid them. Yeah. And until you, certain people are willing to have that conversation to go, hey. I'm willing to be wrong if you're willing to be wrong. Yeah. If you say if you say that, I go okay, because I am willing to be wrong. It's funny because I get called arrogant all the time, never willing to p change yeah. my positions. If you believe that, you have not wa watched the church split because I have changed my positions on more things than I can count. I've told personal stories of when someone kicked my butt in an argument yeah. and I changed my position. I'm more than willing to have my views challenged, but I need to know the person I'm willing to, that wants to talk to me or talk to you. Yeah. And I think there's a general rule that you should apply to right. yourself. If the person's not willing to change their position, yeah. then why argue with them? Right. And here's the thing: we don't hate the King James Bible. It was like we no. don't. I have mine right here. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't stand on the case if we only position. No, because and here's the reason why: because all of a sudden, what I do is uh, I fast forward. And I said the own as far back as I can go is 1769 or 1611 of my King James, uh, possibly the Texas Receptus a few years yep. before that. But really, I can't go to manuscript history and go to the oldest text and say that, hey, um, this is historically accurate all the way down to the closest centuries of Christ. Because you say the Alexandrian texts are corrupt, which they're not. They're the only the only standard by which they're measuring yeah. is they're going. It disagrees with this particular book. Yeah. I could literally have a NASB in front of me yeah. or any other version and go, well, the King James disagrees with this, must be adding to the word of God. Yeah. And it's the same argument. It's just picking one and comparing all ours to that particular one and saying where they, any of them disagree, it must be wrong. But again, translating anyone who knows a second language yeah. knows that that's not how translation works. Yeah. I could get into textual history and stuff, but I have a whole series on textual history. I think you, you've watched it, right? Yeah, or listened it was, to it. Yeah, it was really good. Um, like and it. that was that was a short version. It's like, how do I condense 
a thousand years into. Uh, <laughs> but the time that you got, you did really good. I yeah. Would say, I well, would I appreciate that. that. But honestly, I, and I, that's why I do this because I do want to help people. I, yeah. I, um, I joked with your friend earlier today. I said, "Well, get, busting people out of legalism is my hobby." He's mm-hmm. like, "I should be following Jesus Christ." I'm like, yeah. "Yeah, get with the joke, dude." Like, yeah, yeah no. I doing this because yeah. I do love God, and I'm hoping yeah. that helps people understand the fact that no, the Word of God is strong and it's pure. It is preserved, not just in the 1611. Yeah. But all the way through history and all these other translations, this is God's word mm-hmm. and you can hold on to it and you can know historically speaking, Amen. we can prove it. And that's a powerful position. It's so much more powerful than picking one arbitrary English yeah. English translation saying that's got to mm-hmm. be the one. Idolatry. Yeah, it <laughs> is. Well, it is. So it is idolatry. And you recently, um, of course, everyone, if you haven't seen this, watched the episode before, you recently were... Uh, kicked out. Yeah. K- literally kicked out. We, no, yes, we... Stood before the church, but if he did not stand before the church, forceful, forceful measures were going to be taken. Yeah, you, you they basically, he was like, Hey, I need you to resign publicly. If you don't do this, I'm gonna to have to force you to do it anyway. So just do this, uh, on your own and make my life easier. Essentially, yeah. was the was the moral. Yeah, and uh, I know you guys were planning on leaving that church beforehand. Yeah, uh, you guys were planning on leaving anyway. But that doesn't change the fact that you were kicked out yeah. before you could leave on your own terms. Yeah. And in your own your own terms and your own peaceful way and mm-hmm. try to make peace before you left. Instead, that uh that pin was pulled on the grenade for you. Yeah. Um, and it was forced and told that they would take forceful measures if not. So it, this is guys, and the reason why we're having this episode, uh, it's not just to get hot gossip out there. It's not to take, yeah. uh, I'll be accused, I'll guarantee you, I'll be accused of taking advantage of you. I'll oh. guarantee you that's going to happen. Be able, as a good um, and uh, if, what's funny is that it's not that straight up, I, I have a message I could show before any of this went down, I reached out to you to have yes. you come on at some point because yeah. I, mean, I thought... We, was we had his um, text message. Yeah, I, I mean, legitimately. And then it was like, well, I never thought, uh, when I said I'll... You want to come on for an interview? I was thinking over Skype, not next to me in my house. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, this is better in person. Yeah, it's way more fun. I actually way prefer in person discussions because yeah. it feels natural. And there's yeah. also not internet problems. So, oh, yes. Anyhow, guys, I hope this was an encouragement to you. Um, I hope Julius' story can help maybe encourage you guys to challenge the status quo a little bit. And also, uh, especially racist theology. I just want to make that my little pin at the end here destroy it get rid of it throw it out it's just as bad i mean the black hebrew israelites say that whiteness is the is the mark of cain and yeah. the curse of ham or whatever and then we have extreme fundamentalists saying as black people guys it's not a skin color mm-hmm. if you guys are reading that going it's a skin color then you're reading that story <laughs> wrong okay it was not they weren't cursed because of their skin yeah they were I mean, cursed I mean, because I'll, of what they good, did though. Oh, goodness, it kills me. It's yeah. Biblical illiteracy is dead anymore, and it drives yeah. me nuts. So, And I will say this. Um, I was raised in an IFB light church, but then I went to more extreme uh, as I got older and went to colleges. And that's why I ex- current, uh, encountered real extremism besides some annoying people in my church. But uh, So I'm thankful that I had a pastor that actually taught theology and doctrine, yeah. and he was an expository preacher. He really was. I went to college, and I knew a lot of stuff that the other people didn't, but then I got surrounded by extreme crazies, and I was like, no, thank you. So um, anyway, Julius, uh, with all this being said, I always ask my guests this. You already know what's coming because I ask all my guests this. How do you think your story here can help unite a divided body? Um, for anybody that grew up in a broken home, anybody that you know was a bus kid, and I know I, I mean I know people who are you know personally text me. I just want to make this video just to be encouraging me. It was like my thing it was like you know you 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 need to know what you believe and why you believe it, and you should not just go to your pastor or just believe your pastor and not go and study for yourself. Um, you heard my thirteen points. And these are no biblical. I mean, these are biblical reasons why I sincerely left. And I would challenge anybody. You no, know, you don't. You do not have to agree with me. But please go out on your own and do your own research from the Bible and see what I'm saying is actually false or or does it actually line up with Scripture? The other thing is like if you're you no, know, for example, King James only us. King yeah. James only us almost have always only read their own sources like Ruckman.com or something. Yeah. Read the other arguments from the people who hold the other position. Learn them. I say this all the time. I know my opponent's arguments better than they do. Why? Because I've studied their position so yeah. well that I know where they're going. You can't be biased. You can't, you can't For argue. example, I can argue with any uh, person who's pro-choice, and I know every argument they're going to make, and I have a, a, a better counter-argument. And it's not because, oh, I should, I, I'm a pro-abortionist. No, I, but I know what they're saying. I understand their position yeah. so I can properly represent them and then tackle the actual issue. The problem is everyone I know, everyone I've ever met, 
who has truly ever studied the issue out. On the other end, the actual textual quote unquote criticism part, which they misunderstand that all the time. If the, the, everyone who I know who has actually gone into the scholar, scholarly work has walked out not a King James onlyist, yep, because it's the <laughs> evidence, the evidence is overwhelmingly against it. Yes, it's there's not a single strong yeah. argument for it. Can so. I uh, can I recommend a book real fast? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think you, you have it in your office here. Um, James White, the um, the King James controversy, mm -hmm. and there's another one. Shout out to um, Mark Ward for making the book. Um, Authorized. I read it, and that changed my view when I started to look at the King James, not at the Word of God, but as a translation. That's what did it for mm -hmm. me. And uh, Mark Ward actually has said he's willing to come on to the show, so I'm mm -hmm. excited for that. Yeah. So, anyway, Julius, thank you, man, and I'm I'm glad you came on. I'm glad you told thank your you. story. I'm glad you were able to kind of get it, say it on your own terms a yeah. little bit, and I think that's important that you're able to do that, and I think it's important that. People understand the fact that what you did wasn't a flippant decision. You no. were in the IFB for a long time. You kept challenging it. You went to your pastor multiple times, multiple mm -hmm. people with the questions. Because, again, you were experiencing the overwhelming, yeah. against position, overwhelming evidence against your position. And what you chose to do was you chose to try the other side to see if they have a response. Yeah. And since they didn't, you changed your mind. Yeah, because 13 years in the IFB, and I used the King's Age Bible because, no, I was a KJV on this. I, did, I hate, hated the ESV and all these other verses, but I was like, my team was like, I cannot be biased. I was like, I love truth more than anything else, yep. and I came out not being a KJV only. Well, as Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. So, anyway, thank you, Julius, for that. Guys, if you haven't liked and subscribed to The Church Split, give Julius uh, some encouragement in the comments below on YouTube. And uh, if you haven't, uh, leave a five-star review and tell the, tell Julius how awesome he is, even though he is a, a Michigan State <laughs> Spartans fan. What are you trying to say? I'm just <laughs> that they're not as cool as the Wolverines, that's all. Uh, the Bible says it's not good for, t uh, for us to lie. Uh, oh. Okay. Well, the Bible also says not to show partiality, so... Okay. Um, Maybe we should we maybe we should have just put our fights away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, take care, and I'll see you next time on the church split.